Good evening and welcome back to Adventures in Lollygagging. I'm Aaron and I'm once again in the Game Master's seat as we transition from Robert E. Howard's Swords and Sorcery and Conan to Cubicle Sevens, Grim Dark Future, Warhammer 40K, Wrath and Glory. Thanks for coming along as we shift gears, a hard shift. We're going to go around, we're going to let all the players introduce who they are, and they're going to tell us their experience with Warhammer 40k. Uh, and I and I think we're going to get a wide range of opinions on this. We're going to start with Long. Yes, Space Marines and some sort of Horde is what Warhammer is. He's not wrong. There There is aspects <laughs> of that. We may even see some Hordes uh, before the end of our campaign. How about you, Melissa? Uh, yeah, Melissa. Um, I know that, you know, playing a uh, female space marine has had some discussion around it. And that's about all I know about Warhammer 40k. That's true. Anybody out there who knows, knows there are no female space marines. It's uh, it's completely male. That's the Hey, the game started in the 80s, everybody. There's not much I can do about it. The lore is decades old. However, there are badass women warriors in power armor wielding chain swords. You will definitely see some sisters of battle. I have a feeling. All right, Jeff. Yeah. Hey, I'm Jeff. Uh, let's see. I know a little. I've never actually played Warhammer 40K, but I have several of their miniatures and I've painted them. I've also played a little bit of Space Hulk, the video game, and one or two other Warhammer video games. Never played the actual, any of the miniatures games itself. I would say I'm definitely the middle ground where a few people in here know absolutely nothing and a few know a lot, and I'm somewhere in the middle is probably where I would be. Excellent. Ashley, what end of the spectrum are you on? Oh, bottom. I know <laughs> that there's figurines that you can paint, uh, which is really cool. I know there's video games on Steam that I've had recommended to me, but I've never played. Uh, or minis. Sorry, Jeff. Excuse me. Wrong terminology. <laughs> oh, you, you actually you actually read my list. I'm like, figurines. I saw, I saw you <laughs> sassing me. Uh, and that, uh, spoiler alert, Justin's read so many of the books. And that's that's my knowledge. <laughs> All right. So we'll we'll take it over to our new player. Welcome, Justin. Uh, I'm the exact opposite of what Ashley is. Uh, I think I've read maybe 20 of the books. A lot of the Horus Heresy. I love everything that has to do with uh, uh, Magus and uh, the uh, whole series around that. Um, I have painted stuff. I got into it because my brother does it, and I, I, I want to do some too. I've painted stuff. I love playing the Dark Angels. And... Um, this is this is a really big deal to me, so I'm really excited about it. Thank you very much for letting me join your fun time. I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm kind of there with Justin. I started back in the 80s when it first came out, doing some of the war gaming, some of the skirmish games. Uh, read a ridiculous amount of the novels. If I if I added up all the money I've spent on Warhammer 40k novels, it would probably make me cry. I just went back and reread all the Caiaphas Kane novels. Highly recommend those. All the Dan Abnett, uh, Gaunt uh, novels There's like are fantastic. Twelve of them. I know they're awesome. Jeez. The old, the original Ian Watson Inquisitor War trilogy, fantastic. So, I love the setting. I love the game. I think Cubicle Seven has done an amazing job with this game. So, what we're going to do is, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an explanation of the setting we're going to play in. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanics, so everybody at home knows what we're dealing with. Then we're going to dive into some character creation. So, Aaron, to begin, I'm interrupt you real quick because there's yes. a question in chat. What yes. book would you recommend someone start with? Ooh, start with. You start with That's a tough one. You start with uh, Xenos. Well, yeah. If you're if you're reading if you're reading Ian Watson's Inquisitor War, you would start. Uh, well, you would. That's that's earlier. So that that happens thousand years before our current time. I would say if you're going to start with any book, if you really want to get a handle of what it feels like, I would start with. Um, yeah, I would start with the Eisenhower or. Uh, no, I would start. I would start with. Gaunt's Ghost, first book, Dan Abnett, 
uh it's 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 a war it's a war novel so i mean these are these are soldiers of the imperium fighting it's fantastic now if you want to start with the history go back to the first book in the horus heresy but if you start that you're going to be reading about 40 books um because the horus <laughs> heresy never ends it's uh it's an amazing series uh some of the books are fantastic if you like space marines any of the anthologies dan abnett uh, wrote a good one um about uh the about the salamanders but uh come talk to us in discord and i will vomit an entire list of books for you to read based on your personal interests if you want something funny or serious or terrifying i've got it all between justin and i i'm fairly certain we can uh fill you in on the whole world yeah so, I, would, I would i would has picked up the kipser role from the x-men game yeah. Uh, so that is, that and you've is just been your, you're just being yourself. I'm just being myself. <laughs> I'm a full on geek. I, I'm full well, spectrum. I would, I would double down. When he says, "Kafai's Kane's uh, is really great. The Eisenhower trilogy is where I started, and I, I loved it. It's like it's also like it's noirish. It's mm -hmm. it's detectiveish. It's it kind of puts you in that world. And then the Horus Heresy is fantastic. Horus Rising is one of the greatest books that were ever written in the entire series. But yeah, it's, it is great. Like you said, you're getting into 40 books, with of which I'd say 30 are complete garbage. So uh, you're not wrong. He's not yeah. wrong. Yeah, you got to keep it tight on the Horus Heresy because it's uh, you know it's like the Wheel of Time novels. You start on a through a through path and then you branch off into madness. So um, okay, but that's enough of that. We're going to. Listen to an excerpt from the writings of Inquisitor Raphael Rust of the Ordo Originatus. As written, the Order, the Era Dominitus, also called the Age of Dark Imperium, is a name given to the period in the history of the Imperium of Man, which began with the destruction of Cadia by the forces of chaos in the 13th Black Crusade and the subsequent formation of the Great Rift across the galaxy. This period is marked by the physical division of the Imperium into two halves by the Great Rift. The Imperium Nihilus, across the northern half of the galaxy where, psychic, where the psychic beacon of the Emperor's Astronomicon is no longer visible, and the Imperium Sanctus, that includes the rest of the Imperial space where the Astronomicon is still detectable. The Imperium Nihilus, also known as the Dark Imperium and Low Gothic, was the name given to the half of the Imperium of Man isolated from Terra after the formation of the Great Rift, the so-called Cicatrix Maledictum, during the climax of the 13th Black Crusade in 999.m41. The Imperium Nihilus encompasses most of the Segmentum Obscurus and Segmentum Ultima in the northern and eastern reaches of the galaxy and was a defining feature of astrography of the Milky Way galaxy during the period known as the Era Indominus. The Dark Imperium was well named for beyond the Great Rift, the light of the Astronomicon was obscured to the side of navigators and the Imperium was roiled by the waxing might of the ruinous powers, making faster than light or void travel and astropathic communication extremely difficult, if not impossible. The Gilead system was one such system isolated from the greater Imperium by the Cicatrix Maledictum. The Great Rift was a daily threat to the citizens of Gilead. A scar across the sky of every world, the impossibly large warp storm, a daily reminder of the pervasive threat of chaos, as well as the incredible importance of their home. Their few but diverse worlds stand as a bastion of hope against the darkness, that is, if the propaganda of the administratum is to be believed. Under their honeyed words lies the truth, however. The Gilead system is cut off from the light of the emperor. They have no reinforcements, no means of leaving the system, and no communication with the wider Imperium. But they are but one of countless forgotten and lost systems. Inquisitorial note. The Gilead system was, in fact, the point of origin from which the rogue trader flotilla of Jackal Veronius, under the guidance of his navigator Octavia Omnicara breached the Cicatrix Maledictum, bringing hope to the system and a much-needed consolidation of authority under the rogue trader's imperial writ. That is the setting we are going to be finding ourselves in. We will be in the Gilead system. 
shortly after the rogue trader Jackal Veronius and his flotilla has made system fall out of the warp. So a little bit about the game mechanics. Um, much like Conan, Wrath and Glory is a dice pool system. Where Conan was a D20, this is a D6 system. So whenever a character tries to do something and the result is uncertain, we roll a test. The test is based on the sum of their attribute and their skill. Very much like Conan. If you get a result of a four or a five on your dice, that counts as an icon. If you get a six on your dice, that counts as two icons or two successes. So four fives are one success, six is two successes. You compare that against the difficulty number if it's a skill check or the defense number if you're in combat. And if you get more successes than you need it, then, then you succeed. One of the quirks of the system is the wrath die. One of your D6 pool is going to be a dice of a different color. Now, obviously, we're using Foundry, and Foundry does a very good job. Uh, Cubicle 7 invests a lot into making their Foundry modules really work well. I got to give them props for that. So you'll see that the Foundry system does really well with it. But if you're doing it at home with regular dice, have one dice that's a different color and you roll that, that's your Wrath dice. It's not an additional dice, it just replaces one of the dice from your pool. Now, it's a normal dice. If you get a four or five on it, it counts as one success. Uh, however, if you get a one, that is a Wrath complication. And kind of like Conan in some ways, you could succeed however you get a complication or you could fail and have additional complications. If you get a six on the Wrath dice, that's a Wrath critical. Um, and with you get a Wrath critical, you automatically get a point of glory, which we'll talk about in a minute. And you get some additional benefits depending on whether or not you're in combat or it's just a skill check. Um, so those that's your dice pool. That's how your dice pool works. If you succeed your roll and you have additional D6s left over in excess of that roll, you can shift those D6s. And what that means is as you pull that D6 out, you don't count it as part of your success, but by shifting it, you get additional or different benefits. Uh, you can shift it to get additional information. You can shift it to get additional damage in combat. You can shift it to improve your critical. There's a, there's different ways of doing that. And we'll go through the mechanics of shifting it the next time we play and we actually get into the into some dice rolling. We'll 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 step through these processes, you know, one by one. Much like Conan, there are multiple meta currencies within the game. Um, we talked about the Wrath dice, but there are also Wrath points, and each character gets Wrath points. They are individual to the character. You start out with two every session, and you could spend those to either modify your roles or add narrative declarations, etc. Once again, we'll go through that more um, uh, the next time we play. There's also Glory, hence the name of the game, Wrath and Glory. Glory is the collective currency that players get. So any, like I said, anytime you roll a six on your wrath die, you get a point of glory. There are other ways to get points of glory. You can shift successful D6s over for glory. And this is a joint pool that all players can pull from uh, for additional dice when they're rolling, for additional damage, etc. Um, for you guys, since there are, are five players, your maximum glory will be seven. And I will remind you of that. So if if you have seven glory in your in your glory pool, spend it because you're you're not going to get additional glory on top of that. And just like uh, there was momentum and to our glory in uh, in this game, we have the same thing. The DM here doesn't have doom. I have ruin. So I think I should be the ruin master for this game. But it's it's very similar to what you saw in Conan. It gives me the ability to spend rune to provide add complications, and then there are certain uh, adversaries in the game that can spend rune for specific things, just like Doom was in Conan. That's the basics of the game. It'll make a lot more sense when we're actually rolling dice in a couple of weeks, but I wanted to get everybody an understanding of, of, of how the basic mechanics work. So we're going to be spending tonight, we're going to be building characters. Uh, a couple things we need you need to know about building characters in Wrath and Glory. The first is your characters are going to be based on certain factions. 
Now, I've already told everybody that we are playing Imperium. We're playing part of the Imperium of Mankind for our game. The adventures I've selected to run are Imperium selections. So the Imperium is a faction. Now, the Imperium has several sub-factions within it. We're going to get introduced to some of them this evening while we're doing character creation. In addition, in this game, on top of Imperium, you could play Aldari. Uh, now, if you don't have any idea what Aldari is, you know, they're grace, graceful, powerful warriors with strong psychic uh, abilities and incredible technology. Um, for anybody who wants to equate it to anything, think Space Elf. Um, really, really badass Space Elf. The Aldaris have craft worlders, which is, are basically like these enormous floating cities. Um, those are the Aldari that you're most likely to deal with in a positive way. Um, and here within the Gilead system, the craft world Aldari are not really allies, but they're not enemies either. They're accepted as a potential resource. And I'll get into why that's important in the setting in a little bit. There are also Corsairs. They're basically space elf pirates. Um, and then there are the Drukari, and these are the chaos-infected dark elves. These are your super evil elves. Um, in addition, in the game, if you wanted, you could play orcs. Um, the orc faction exists. You could play an entire group of orcs. Uh, orcs in the game, very similar to what you think of in fantasy orcs. They're giant, green, hulking, androgynous entities. Orcs in Warhammer 40k are uh, they're a mixture of biological, animal, mammalian, and fungus. So they do not they do not sexually reproduce. They asexually reproduce. They emit spores that grow into orcs. And much like fungus, their entire existence is to spread and to conquer. So they are considered very primitive, very brutal, very aggressive. But they are the most populous species in the galaxy, with potentially the exception of the Tyranid. Uh, they are a very successful, successful spacefaring race, uh, but we will not be playing orcs because as fun as it is to do an orc one-shot, trying to do an orc campaign is difficult to manage. Uh, and then last but not least, in Warhammer and in, in Wrath and Glory, uh, you can play Chaos, Beings of Chaos, and that's if your party wants to play the super chaotic evil people. You know, if you want to be a bunch of murder hobos, you can you can do a, a Chaos campaign once again very difficult to manage long term which fun for a one shot but can get kind of tedious after a while so those are your factions each faction or is associated with keywords in this game now a keyword for you guys everybody will have the imperium keyword if you're a mechanicus priest you'll have the mechanicus keyword and the imperium keyword so you can you can get multiple keywords and these are they defi help define what your character is, but within the mechanics of the game, they do more than that. If you share keywords with other people in a civilized setting, you can improve your ability to influence them or to command them. It also is a gatekeeper for certain talents that you might want to buy. You know, if you don't have the right keyword, you can't buy the, a talent. Uh, and finally, it also isolates certain items of war gear. Like if you want to have Adeptus Astartes power armor, you have to be an Adeptus Astartes. You know, you 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 cannot be a, a, an underhive scummer and and get a suit of space marine armor. It just doesn't work that way. So that's how keywords work within the frame of the game. The last step I'm going to talk about before we actually get into character creation is frameworks. Now, the game is basically saying we've got a group of, of disparate individuals from different factions coming together for some reason. And what is that reason? And that's what the framework is. It kind of defines your reason for coming together and doing the things you do. Uh, and there, there's all sorts of frameworks. You could be a group of uh, Imperium personnel working for the Administratum trying to figure out why the tithes on these worlds doesn't meet the requirement for the empire. Uh, however, once again, I kind of shoehorned everybody here into one of two frameworks. I gave them the opportunity to either be an inquisitorial war band, and the Inquisition is an imperial faction. They are the most powerful imperial faction, probably. Uh, they are the agents of the emperor 
who are responsible for protecting the empire against threats to the empire. Uh, there are three main ordos or orders of of the uh, of the Inquisition: the Ordo Xenos, which are responsible for dealing with alien threats; the Ordo Hereticus, which is responsible for dealing with threats from within. This could be heretics, it could be cultists, it could be just basic insurrection, it could be rogue psychers, any of the like. And the Ordo Malleus, and they are responsible for dealing with threats due to the warp. So we're talking demons and heretical texts that allow for people to summon demons and the like. So they are very, um, there's a lot of angst uh, when it when it deals with inquisitorial war bands, very Machiavellian, very uh, do it my way or die. Uh, so for some reason, I don't know why, everybody decided to go with the other framework that I offered Shockers. up. And that is to be troubleshooters who are working directly for the Veronius rogue trader family, whose responsibilities are to travel throughout the Gilead system and put out fires before they can spread. Because the Veronius writ, imperial writ, basically tells him, wherever you go, spread the imperial rule. Protect the empire, protect its interests, ensure its person or its people thrive, all in the name of the rogue trader's profit. But his writ gives him vast authority over imperial doings. And all of the different planetary governors within the Gilead system saw an opportunity to invest Jackal Veronius with greater authority to handle the system-wide issues so they could kind of wipe their hands of problems and let him and a few other agents of the Imperium deal with it. And that's that's what our, our group chose. They chose to be um, a troubleshooting uh, organization or group under the Veronius uh, Imperial writ. So that's where we're at, um, and we're going to start diving into character archetypes here. Now, we are starting at tier two, so that's one of the other things. When you think, if you think like levels, like Dungeons and Dragons levels or something like that, tiers kind of match up with that. The tiers start at one, they go up to six. We're starting at two. So these guys aren't complete novices, but they've got a ways to go before they're running entire planetary systems. Within tiers, there are also ranks. There are three ranks, and basically they're just um, benchmarks as you move your way up towards the next tier. After you get 30 experience points, you go up in rank. So you would go from rank zero to rank one, and then rank one to rank two, then to rank three, and then you would have the opportunity to ascend to the next tier. Um, why ranks matter is there are a lot of talents in the game that will give you bonuses based on your rank. And once again, we'll get into that as we get going. So as I said, we're starting everybody at tier two. I gave everybody a lot of background information on the archetypes available at tier one and tier two that they could choose from. Uh, so we're going to start looking in Foundry. Um, and I'm going to start with Jeff, because I know Jeff has some ideas about what he might want to be. So Jeff, when you're looking at your character, what archetype are you thinking about? Okay, so I've got a couple different options, but what the main the main similarity between them is Adeptus Mechanicus, because I love Adeptus Mechanicus. Uh, so the priesthood folks from Mars. Um, it's gonna depend upon like the group dynamic a little bit in terms of what I go, but probably first choice is Electro Priest, uh, which just came out in the like redacted records number two. Uh, and those are basically fanatical kind of warrior types, like warrior monk priest types. Uh, and they have like these where, whereas a lot of like the tech priests and stuff are like more, uh, like augmentations that are like additional limbs, additional eye, things like that. The electro priests, they actually have stuff like coursing through them. And depending upon like which side of the schism you go, cause there's like different ways of worshiping, um, like the mode of force and everything, uh, you can you either you're either like doing uh what's it called like force lightning kind of stuff or you're just like using like a big old uh, a big old uh, staff so electro priest is probably my my number one uh but if we're if we're pretty heavy on melee uh, i might do something uh, a little bit more tech priesty with like uh with like more kind of like a like a scientist kind of 
just smarts guy. But electric priest, I kind of want to do because like, I, I do want to get up and you know and bang a bit. I, I, I said go for it, regardless. Yeah. I mean, the, regardless, the tech priests have a lot of a lot of skills anyway. Even if you're more focused on combat, and for everybody out there, uh, the Mechanicum, um, the tech priests of Mars. They worship the Omnissiah, the great machine god. Now, to everybody else in the Empire, they all think that the Omnissiah is just another face of uh, the Emperor on his golden throne on Holy Terra. But for the, the tech priests of Mars uh, and the Mechanicum, they, they see the Omnissiah as a separate deity, separate and equal to the Emperor. And the Mechanicum, they're, it's an interesting, they're responsible for for manufacturing all the technology within the Imperium, maintaining all the all the technology in the Imperium. If they recover archaeotech, Imperial technology from earlier ages, they are allowed to understand that archaeotech and bring it in, back into the Imperium because it's Imperial technology. But it is absolute heresy for a tech priest to innovate. You don't make anything better. That's heresy. It is absolutely heresy for a tech priest to ever use Xenos technology or incorporate Xenos technology into their technology. Um, it is absolute heresy for a tech priest to give up all of his biological components. Because way back in the early days of the Imperium of Man, long before the emperor was on his golden throne, long before the uh, early Crusades, Humanity created artificial intelligence and just, hey, everybody's seen the Terminator. That's exactly what happened. The artificial intelligence went to war against humanity and humanity barely won. And that's why they're like, artificial intelligence is never allowed. There can never be fully synthetic humans again. And, and you can never innovate to the point where you might uh, birth artificial intelligence. And that's why all their computers, their their cogitators, all of this the, the technology is fairly rudimentary. And they've actually lost the ability to understand how to make some of the techs, like some of the great void ships they can't make anymore. So it is grim dark. I mean, this is dystopian future. Uh, we are not propelling into a great and glorious empire. We are just trying to hold the line against external and internal decay. But yes, the Mechanicus are awesome. Mm. So if Jeff is thinking about becoming a Mechanicum, um, Justin, what are you thinking about becoming? So uh, I got to go with my uh, boy uh, Ravenor, and um, I got to make sure that I, I do my best interrogator stuff with the Inquisition. So I chose to be an interrogator. Um, they're basically an apprentice of an Inquisitor. Uh, Gregor Eisenhorn was like the most famous one. They're basically like an inquisitor is essentially I go around and try and snuff out all things that are not Imperium based. And so an interrogator is his rookie sidekick. So I'm that guy who just joined the force. He's shown me the ropes. And in doing so, I just so happen to also have to like torture people and like get information out of them because <clears throat> when you're part of the inquisition, it's very much like the old inquisition, the Spanish inquisition where uh, they do whatever needs to be done to root out all uh, signs of Xenos or, or, or signs of, of the warp because uh, they're fanatical in what they have to do in, in order in, in the eyes of the emperor. So I'm going to be an interrogator. I'm basically like space detective slash torturer. That's kind of what I am, yeah. but like awful. That's what, that's what I do. Yeah, I mean, uh, an Inquisitor would call Exterminatus on a planet and kill a planet of 40 billion souls um, without blinking an eye if, by doing that, it would destroy a gene stealer cult that might infect the rest of the em Empire. So they have no compunction. I mean, they, they're, they've got a... One, one, uh, one writ, and that's to protect the empire. And no individual, no single planet, uh, matters as much as the empire. So that's exactly accurate. Now, Justin, I'm going to ask you because you know a bit. Um, what ordo do you think your inquisitor is from? What ordo do you want to be associated with? Well, I want to. I want to be as close to 
uh, Eisenhower's a can, so probably be Xenos. Um, Hereticus, I'm I'm not going to rat out my boys, so I don't want to be Hereticus, right? I'm not going to go mm-hmm. in there and 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 rat on my friends. Okay, that's not what we do. Um, and uh, Malice is just like it's a little bit too dark for me. I'd much rather get rid of aliens than rid of demons. So that's, that's my awesome. kind of thing. And like I, I expect at some point to use some of the warp because that's what we all do at some point. So why am I going to go? against malice is at what right now is because i'm mm-hmm. going to do it eventually so well that brings me to my next question do you does your is your inquisitor a puritan or is your inquisitor a radical well that's great somewhere question. in between that's a great question there aaron i'm so glad we're having this conversation i finally get to have this with somebody um so for me <laughs> eventually they all do become right Either the greatest of us of all some inquis- inquisitors eventually dabble into the warp because in order to understand the enemy, you must become part of the enemy in order to uh, eradicate them from existence. So even my 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 uh, the guy that I worship the most, uh, Gregor Eisenhorn, uh, compromised his position in the Inquisition to uh, to to beat those uh, that were facing against the Emperor. So I do expect at some point I might have to dabble in order to win. So you know, that's how it goes. So are you saying you're going to go so far as to perhaps summon a demon host and bind it to you? Uh... <laughs> um true by all so i want you to know this uh my character in world of warcraft right now who is a tauren his name is chamu Bael, and no one understands <laughs> it except for me uh because he's a cow and he's a warlock so he's chamu Bael. i love it i would be okay with doing such things if it meant that it would save the imperium and my friends all right well who knows we may see that happen um, all right, so we've got somebody, uh, an inquisitor who's who's maybe somewhere between Puritan and radical sliding, and we've got his he's of the ordo Xenos, and we have his interrogator. Um, I love it. I would like between now and the time we play, give me a little write up of your inquisitor. Let me know what your inquisitor is all about. That'll be I, one of your little homework. Jeff, I'm gonna need some help with some creative writing skills. So, I'm <laughs> geometry teacher, Justin not to my homework. strength. Chat chat GPT. Was that is that, that that's there all you do. yeah, that's all anyone does anymore in my classes. So uh, so we've got uh, a member of the Mechanicum, we've got a member of the Inquisition. Uh so long, what are you thinking? Yeah, as Jeff said this earlier, listening to this game is like a new language. Like I understand the words, but I don't know what it even means. <laughs> right. But I was looking under Adeptus Ministorum. Mm-hmm. As a death cult assassin. Oh, so wonderful. I was looking to become pretty much a zealot of extreme sect. I honor the emperor's sacrifice for humanity through the ritual slaughter of his enemies. That's so I'm just going to get up there, get gory for the emperor. So, yeah. So the uh, officio uh, assassinorum is, is really part of the administratum. Uh, and it's actually controlled by one of the minor uh, ordos of the Inquisition. However... Um, th- because of their faith in the emperor, they do have access to faith talents. So that's why in this game they're included in the Ministorum. So basically, what happens is in the lore, a uh, an assassin is dispatched, um, is given orders, a remit to kill like a specific guy or a specific country. You know, it could be a thousand people. It doesn't matter. That's they go out and they do it. So I expect, and I love the Death Cult Assassin. It's a fantastic archetype. So I expect what we'll see is that you're probably will have been seconded, um, depending on whether or not you come from the Gilead system or whether or not you come f- with Veronius on his fleet to this group uh, to provide them direct support. So we'll see how that goes. But I love it. Death Cult Assassins are... They're as grim as as grim gets, or they can also be crazy. Once again, if you want to, if you want to read a book that has good death cult assassin in it, Ian Watson's Inquisitor War, his uh, the Inquisitor in that Jock Draco's uh, right hand soldier is a uh, a female death cult assassin named Melindy, and she is terrifying. Makes me smile on the inside. Okay, now that we've got a death cult assassin. Uh, we've got uh, an inquisitorial interrogator and a mechanicum. Ashley, what are we thinking? Uh, I'm thinking Sister Hospitaller. Nice. Adeptus Sororitas, a battle sister. Yes. The Emperor's Nuns. Um, 
Excellent. So uh, you'll be one of the uh, one of the orders of the uh, Sisters of Battle. The Hospitallers are uh, often known. Uh, they're, I mean, they're all Sisters of Battle are warriors, but the Sisters Hospital are uh, they provide uh, greater support than say some of the other more militant orders. So that's fantastic uh, for everybody out there who's unsure of the lore. Um, back. Once again, you go back far enough in the history of the Imperium of Man, the Ministorum, after the imp, after the god emperor became started being worshipped as a god, before that he was just the emperor. After he became worshipped as a god, the Ministorum and the cult of the emperor uh, kind of grew and grew and grew. And then the Ministorum started forming its own armies. And then there was a schism in the Ministorum and a civil war. A lot of bad things happened. And then after they beat the bear snot out of the Ministorum. Uh, the Ministorum was told, no longer will you be allowed to form uh, an army of men in support of the Ministorum. So they were like, loophole, and the Sisters of Battle were born. Um, and they are absolute badasses. Okay. Ashley. We've got a hospitaler. Jeff, we've got a mechanicum. Justin, we've got an inquisitorial interrogator. Long, we've got a death cult assassin. Melissa, that leaves you. What are you thinking? Straight up sister of battle. Fantastic. Okay. So we've got uh, two sisters of battle from different uh, orders. Um, we've got our interrogator. We've got a death cult assassin. And we have a mechanicum. So, Jeff, now that you've heard what everybody else is, are you sticking with Electro Priest because they're badass? Uh, so, 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 out of curiosity, I know we, we're not we're not the skills and stuff yet. So, like, long, do you, you you mentioned it before? Do you see yourself like like in terms of like kind of getting up in it, like getting up, you know, getting up feisty, like at the melee kind of stuff, or are you more like staying at range, snipey, shooting from a distance kind of guy? I'd imagine the assassin more melee for me. Okay. What about you? What about you, Melissa? I don't really care about Justin. But what about you, Melissa? Do, do you are you gonna like guns from a I'm, distance, or are you getting up in yeah, that? Yeah, because I I just got to do like the chain sword thing, so I think I might go yeah. a little more range. Yeah. All okay. sisters of battle will they'll, they'll, she'll be given a holy bolter, a flamer, which is just a a big flamethrower to because burning heretics is what you do, and you'll have a chain sword if you want. So. Okay, then 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 I will probably go. So with 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 the electro priest, you have to choose mm -hmm. one side of a schism, and like the schism kind of revolves around how they approach like the motive force. And so there's like the uh, the corpus cari, and then there's the fulgrate. I'm gonna go fulgrate. Uh, the fulgrate uh, they uh, they they have they carry like this big old electro leech uh, staff, and they can essentially. They, their view is that bioelectrical energy is kind of wasted on living things. <laughs> like, and so they just drain it from, from well, everything, basically. Mm -hmm. And so that's essentially what I'm going to go. So I, that's the route I'm going to go. So, yeah, I'll be, I'll be going that route. I love it. So when you open your character sheets, uh, were you able to find uh, or have you looked yet for uh, where your particular um, archetype is. If you go under like the, the little icon that looks like a uh, briefcase, it says items. If you scroll down, most of your archetypes are going to be in the core book. Uh, Justin's, yours is in um, the uh, Forsaken okay. Systems archetype. Um, everybody else's, except for Jeff's, who's in Redacted Records too, which we're going to have to build separately. I, I, I'm uh, not building it. We're good. Okay. So if you open it up, you find your, um, you find what you're looking for, uh, then you should just be able to drag it over to your character sheet and drop it in, and you'll you'll see. Yeah, it asks to begin character creation. Yep. The window comes Hit up. Yes on that. Yep. Hit yes on that, and we'll begin the character creation process. So, everybody got something in there. Where's the character sheet? Is it under actors? Uh, yeah. If, if you look under actors, you'll see one that has your name on it. And uh, just open that up. Your name is Justin, by the way, in case you're <laughs> pick up. <laughs> and then if you go back to the briefcase and you look under the 
archetypes for forsaken systems and you scroll down you will see interrogator if you drag that over onto your sheet it will ask you if you want to start character creation Got it. Everybody there? Okay, so when you look at your character, when you look at the character creation sheet, I think they do a pretty good job. Uh, first, it goes through your species, because there is an option in this game. If you don't want to do archetypes, if you just want to freehand and make somebody yourself, you can just take 200 experience points. You can spend whatever experience points you want on whatever species you want. Uh, and then just build a character with no archetype. However, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to stick with archetypes uh, for this play. So we're all human. Uh, human, the experience point cost for being a human is zero. Like if you wanted to be a space marine, it's, it's like 130. Um, so you can see that there's a wide difference. Your size is average because we're all average, at least to begin with. Uh, then your next column over will say whatever your archetype is. And that will tell you what the experience cost for that package was, what the tier of that package is, what your basic influence is, any skills or attributes that are required for that. And those the experience points for those skills and attributes will already be tallied. Um, any keywords that you get and then your special ability. OK, now, before we go further in this column, I want everybody to look on, over on the far right column where it says customization. Now, I think everybody but Ashley probably says 200 experience points there or does Ashley and. Yeah. OK, Ashley, as uh, you say, 100. Yeah. OK, put put that to 200 and that way it'll keep a running total of what your actual experience uh, points cost is. OK. OK. Now, back into the second column, after you look at your ability, now, every different archetype in this game has a different ability or a set of different abilities. If, let's say, you ascend, we ascend to the next tier. If you ascend to tier three and you check, you take a whole different archetype, if it thematically works, you would still keep your old um, ability from your old archetype and you would get the new ability from the new archetype. Um, under that, you get your war gear. Now, it will list all the war gear that you get standard. Now, some of you may have choices. Like under some weapons, it may give you choices. Jeff, I know we're having to build yours from scratch, so we'll just plug yours in. Ashley, do, do you have any choices under your war gear? Um, It doesn't have any, like, ores or anything. Okay. It's just a list. So what? read for us what the, what, uh, the sister hospitaler has for war gear. Um, I have Striatus Power Armor, mm -hmm. um, Something Tools, Chain Bayonet, uh, Last Pistol, Vestments, and Rules of the Striatus. Okay. So that's your basic uh, sister of, of battle gear. So you've got your Power Armor, you've got a Laz Pistol, you've got a Chain Bayonet that you can affix to a weapon. Um, so... Once again, you're ready to fight, but that's not necessarily the primary purpose of a sister hospitaler. Melissa, how about you? What do you have for your war gear? So I've got the Sororitas Power Armor, a Chaplet mm -hmm. Ecclesiastic, Sororitas Vestments, mm -hmm. a Writing Kit, Rule of the Sororitas, and then went with the bolt gun option instead of the bolt pit and chain sword. Fantastic. I know Chad was dismayed that I was not picking the chainsword, but I'm going to go bolt gun. Well, you may get an opportunity to get a pick up a chainsword at some point anyway. But yeah, the bolt gun is like heavier than a bolt pistol. Um, and a bolt gun fires explosive rockets that totally destroy and disintegrate things. They're wonderful weapons. I love them. Uh, so you've got the sword as armor. You've got your vestments. You've got your robes. You've got your parchments and, and the rules of being... Uh, a battle sister and battle sisters carry that and the and uh, and the liturgies of the emperor with them into battle you know like same kind of thing you might have like a giant pole up your back and prayer scrolls coming down it you know as you exclaim the emperor's uh word okay justin what are we looking at for interrogator uh we're gonna have symbol of authority uh excruciator which i'm not sure what that is it's like a torture device Okay, sweet. I have a Nero whip. Mm -hmm. Um, and it says rare or less Imperium War Gear, rare or less Imperium War Gear. Rare. So if you click if you click on those, you'll be able to pull up a list. If you want to wait on that, we can we can 
take a look at it offline and figure out what you want to pick. But it'll be things like it'll be things like armor, body gloves, um, additional weapons, probably you know combat shotguns, a bolt pistol, things like that. Uh, the rarity of your war gear determines obviously how badass it is. You're not going to get a power sword at rare or less, but you know at very rare you could potentially get a power sword. So. Um, you can scroll through those and figure out what you want to take. Okay. And your realize. your your symbol of authority is an elect to. So you have the ability to concentrate on the palm of your hand and your and the 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 triple barred eye of the of the uh inquisitorial seal will pop up and float above your hand to let everybody know that you are a member of the Inquisition. All right, so I'm gonna go with the last pistol. Mm-hmm. Um those who don't, it's a laser pistol. Um, I'm trying to find, I'd like to do a body glove. I'm trying to find where it's at. Um, so I'm going to do a, a, a body glove and probably a knife as well. Um, well, I have that melee. should probably do... You could do it. I mean, you might be able to do an auger or... Um... Now, there's different things you can take a look at. Um, and like I said, between now and when we play in two weeks, if you want to switch up your war gear, you get a change of heart, you can do that. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity to requisition additional gear uh, before adventures and after adventures. There's an entire process for that based on influence and wealth and things like that. So uh, just because you're starting with this gear doesn't mean it's the only gear you're ever going to get. I guess right, so we'll come back to that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if I find anything a little bit later, too. I'm going to s- scroll through this. I like it. Long, what's your death cult assassin have? I know a couple things they have. I'm going to be decked out with a body glove, knife, last pistol, and stimulants. And last mm-hmm. but not least, a death cult power blade. Yeah. Gotta love the power swords. Those are very rare items. They're very nice. Very nice. Um, all right. So we've got our war gear. We've set our basic information for our archetype. The third column over um, is these are a little bit. These are choices you can ha- make or you can roll. So for origin, everybody has three cho- three choices. You can either pick one or you can roll if you want to go completely random. But uh, we'll start back with Jeff. Jeff, uh, what origin did you select or roll? Oh well, yours is different. So do you uh, have? Well, no, the origin's still the same because I'm still Adeptus Mechanicus. So like that, okay. that doesn't actually change for Electro Priest. So oh, good, um, good. okay. Um I, I I would roll, but there's one I definitely don't want. So I'm gonna you go just pick. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Voidborn. Uh, I spent my early life aboard an orbital an orbital station built either for defense or industry. Uh, I was a I uh, I were sorry, you were unaware uh planets existed until adolescence. Uh, so I'm going to be void, void born. Um, and then for my accomplishment, I will go, well, we'll go through, we'll go through origins okay, all the way and then we'll come back to gotcha. accomplishments. So Ashley, uh, did you roll for your origin or did you just pick? I just picked one, uh, but mm-hmm. I rolled a D six and it matched. So it works out. So, uh, heresy Beautiful. begets retribution. I survived a brutal heretical assault at great sacrifice. I emerged triumphant through my zeal. Their attacks only made my faith in him stronger. All right. So you were attacked, a heretical attack. So I would think probably as a young girl, maybe before you even were selected uh, to go, maybe this was the event that caused you to be selected to go. Um, you were uh, attacked and kidnapped by a heretical cult that was going to sacrifice you to the ruinous powers in an attempt to summon a demon. But through your strength of will and your faith in he who sits on the golden throne of the empire, you were able to free yourself, maybe even killing some of these heretical cult members. uh, And that reaffirmed your faith in the emperor. I love it. Love it. Melissa. Okay. So as I was looking through the Adeptus Sororitas options, uh, Blessed Tomes reminded me uh, very much of uh, Stephen's character from Hunter uh, that you often quote from your faithful texts. So 
And then uh, Ashley picked Heresy Begets Retribution. So then I will go with the other one, which is Holy Inspiration. You followed in the footsteps of an imperial saint on a pilgrimage, interstellar voyage, or a military campaign. Your idol inspired your faith to new heights. Wonderful. So imperial saints, these are these are people whose faith in the emperor are so strong that they are able to enact miracles. Now, some of you with the ministorum keywords, you'll have the ability to take talents, faith talents that are much like that, much like lesser power miracles. Uh, but, you know, some of these saints were so powerful in their faith in the emperor of mankind that they couldn't die, things like that. So you were following in the foot pen, footsteps of one of these saints. I love it. Cool. Justin, what's your origin? By the way, I figured out my other parts. Uh, body glove and Auspex. Auspex nice. is like uh, uh, in Star Trek when they would like look at their thing and see what was going on. So that's kind of what Auspex is. Uh, I chose, um, I rolled, but I didn't like it. So I just chose because I'm that guy. Um, the Chosen. Uh, I was handpicked to join the Inquisition. An Inquisitor saw my potential or specific skill set and in, in duted me to the Inquisition or employed me for my con for my contacts or, or resources. So I'm the chosen one to torture people. That's kind of what I do. Perfect. And long, what was the origin of your death cult assassin? Guided by visions. So I'm guided by the waking dreams of glorious figures of the creed, preachers, saints, and the God emperor himself. I rely on these questionable, accurate visions. Wonderful. So throughout the, so here's the other thing. Um, like I said, when, when I talked about wrath points, how everybody starts with two wrath points, if you really role play into who your character is, I'll give you bonus wrath points to spend. So if you start talking to invisible people, by God, I'll give you wrath points because I just love that. <laughs> I, I would just love to see your visions play out. All right, so now we'll swing back around to Jeff, and we'll talk about accomplishments. Once again, this is a D6 if you want to roll, or you can just pick. If you've got one that you like, just pick it. Uh, forbidden tech. Uh, I think that's uh, that's calling to me. You encounter technology considered anathema, Xenos machines, heretical experimentation, or something stranger. Did you destroy the abhorrent machine or take a risk? And that is uh, That is my accomplishment. What and you can just you can just direct message me whatever you did because that yeah. might play into some future things. Absolutely, yeah, I'll do that. I love it, uh, Ashley. What's your uh, what's your accomplishment? Oh, uh, where did it go? I am purge the unclean. I let a kill team to wipe out a nest of corruption. Uh, victory came at a cost. Okay, okay. Um, so typically Sisters of Battle um, are seconded to the Ordo Hereticus, and they're dealing with threats from within, so heretical cults, rogue psychers. But you could have just as easily been dealing with a gene stealer cult. These are aliens who uh, genetically modify humans and eventually take over the planetary control and in to prepare the planet for a tyrannid invasion, anything. So, you know, you can think, you can decide, doesn't have to be specific. It was aliens or humans, cults or heretics. Maybe the same cult that um, abducted me and was attempting to sacrifice me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been her goal to eradicate them. I love the it. name of him. I love it. So as a child, you were abducted, you get away, you train, and then you lead a kill team back and wipe this cult out of existence. Fantastic. Melissa, accomplishment. Yeah, so I think that maybe this kind of works together. So I'm going to go defended Enoch. So one of Enoch's many prized holy sites came under assault, and you were there to drive off the attackers. Pilgrims on the shrine world owe you their lives. Okay. Which I think kind so, of fits with the holy inspiration. Yeah, that's, that is awesome. And Enoch is one of the worlds within the Gilead system. Um, so probably you were born in the Gilead system then, which is completely fine, which is good. All right. It's good to have some people in the Gilead, from the Gilead system as well. Uh, Justin, your interrogator, what, what's your... Uh, so what's my your... accomplishment is exterminatus. I watched a world die. 
I stood on the bridge of a void ship, looking down as the terrible mechanism of exterminatus destroyed a planet, killing billions. That's what my accomplishment was. And what? Why was exterminatus called on that on this planet? What? Um, there was a hive city on this world that had um uh, infestation of cult of Nurgle, and we were afraid that there was a train leaving the hive station to a hive city to another hive city to another area and we didn't know how far it had gone so we decided the best way to deal with the situation is pull out the bug bomb and uh, deal with the entire planet can't have plague bearers spreading across the world and, and and leaving a planet to spread further so to destroy the cult of nurgle through the destruction of an entire planet very in keeping with the inquisition uh, and how about our death cult assassin? Trust no one. Ambition and greed permeate even the zealous clerics of the creed. I've suffered at first hand at this corruption, and now I judge the faith of others. All right. All right. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. A, a complete religious zealot who is a master killer who has visions and judges the piousness of everyone around him. This, this makes me smile. This is completely Warhammer 40k. Um, all right, so uh, we're down to goal. So, Jeff, goal. Yeah, this one pairs pretty nicely with the last one. Acquire Archaeotech. The acquisition of technology is a core tenet of your faith. You zealously pursue the possibility of recovering lost Dark Age technology or even a fabled STC. I love it. Oh, I Jeff it. and F- STC. I could tell you what STC is. You want to? All right, I'm, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Share. <laughs> share. So, by all means. So, when uh, the state that 40K is in is 30,000 years after uh, the great uh, expansion of the universe, right? Um, and when that was happening, technology was much higher. It was at a much higher level. And STCs were used during this technology in order to further uh, gains in different planets, whether it was creating hive worlds or other stuff like that. And that's my daughter crying because she's being very crumpy. Um, After the fall of the emperor, (laughs) uh, the people across the galaxy uh, did not further the technology. It stagnated and actually um, atrophied. And so technology actually went back a huge step from where it was 30,000 years ago. So uh, those STCs are like gold. If someone finds it, it's a huge technological advancement to anything. And it's not advancement because it's something that already exists. It's not, you know, so to Mechanicum, it's it's worth 30 billion times what gold would be to a normal person because it's like, it's basically their way, closest way to God. So, actually, it says STP here. So I think it actually means Stone oh, Temple shit. Pilots. <laughs> so I think I'm looking for Stone Temple Pilots. Stone Temple Pilots, of course. <laughs> uh all right, Ashley, how about you? What's your goal? Uh, let's see. I keep rolling fours. Uh, shine the light. Uh, the dark closes in. I intend to push it back. I'll build a monastery and recruit holy warriors to my righteous cause. Nice, nice. You want to you want to you want to form your own monastery, become a canonist and form your own monastery. That's fantastic. Melissa, how about you? What's your goal? Uh, yeah, so I rolled Reclaim a Relic. Long ago, an important Minas Storm relic went missing. You would do anything to recover this relic and restore it to the Ecclesiarchy. All right. I will, uh, I'll come up with a relic for you, and I'll let you know what it is. Okay, cool. Justin, how about you? What's, uh, what's your interrogator's goal? So mine is to find the truth. I am consumed by the search for answers, there is one particular mystery that haunts my dreams, and I will not rest until I've done until I've undone the conundrum. And I want to send you some info, but uh, yeah, I guess you got to friend me on Discord first, so I can't direct message you yet. I'll do it. I'll take I, care I, of that. I'm just gonna. And I, I got him. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff cringes. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh. And Long, what is the goal of your death cult assassin? 
I've got to avenge the loss. Part of my church turned traitor, committing grievous sins and slaying my allies. So I have to find the renegades and judge their crimes, carry out their grim sentences. Fantastic. All right, so we've got uh, we've got uh, we've got some fallen uh, ministorum to uh, to deal with. Fantastic. Okay, now mechanically, um, between your origin, your accomplishment, and your goal, give you can select one of those bonuses. Um, so, what are your three options, Jeff, for your bonus? Okay, so I have a choice of max wounds from my void voidborn influence from forbidden tech, or determination from acquiring acquiring Ar- archaeotech. Okay, so max wounds is is kind of what it sounds like. It's hit yeah. points. You you get a bump to your hit points. Influence. We kind of talked about that at the very beginning. That's your ability to um, get things done in in a civilized world. It's the ability to potentially find information or use your authority to compel people to do things. Um, and your third one was determination, determination, right? So determination is is an interesting mechanic in the game. Um, when you take wounds. Um, they become they can become pretty de- debilitating, and we don't you don't have a lot of wounds in this game. Now, if what you want, if you want, you can roll your determination, and you can shift your wounds to shock. So instead of taking physical trauma, you take emotional or mental trauma. So that keeps you healthier longer. You know, obviously, you run out of wounds, you start dying. You run out of shock, you become exhausted. It's not great, but it's not as bad as dying. So determination helps you deal with that. Obviously, max wounds is hit points. And, so it's your choice. Okay. Hmm. Definitely thinking between wounds and determination. Because like my my uh, my my fulgurite ability is called siphon vigor. So maybe mm-hmm. if you, you you think about which one of these might be better. So the the ability is whenever you deal one or more wounds with your electro leech stav. Uh, you may recover an amount of shock equal to the number of wounds you dealt. Okay, you so think- the, yeah, I mean, determination probably yeah. would be good because then you could shift your wounds to shock and then recover your shock when you That's attack. Yep. Okay. So, and I'll tell you a little bit. So, like your wounds, your maximum wounds is double your tier plus your toughness rating. So we'll get into attributes in a little bit. Um, so everybody's minimum wounds is four, uh, but depending on what your toughness is. You know, your your max racial max is eight. Uh and you you won't get anywhere near eight at the beginning, but uh determination is equal to your toughness rating. So again, it's based off of your toughness. And shock is equal to your willpower rating plus your tier. So we'll and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into attributes so you can get an idea of, of how you want to build your character around that. So, Ashley. What were your th- what are your three bonus options? So I actually don't have any um at this tier. Oh, because you're tier one, your sheet doesn't oh. have yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, your shot your shit uh, does not have that. Okay. Um I'll look them up for you and, and we'll we'll get that bonus set. But when we do your ascension package, you may get the opportunity yeah. at that point. That's what I was thinking. Uh, Melissa, how what were your options? So I have resolve, influence, or determination. So not knowing a whole lot, I was probably leaning resolve. Okay. And resolve is your ability to not be afraid. So if if there's an attack that would cause you fear, you can roll resolve to avoid being afraid. Uh, And there are a lot of things in this game that cause fear. So, I mean, resolve is, is no joke. There's definite benefit to having a high resolve. I think that's what I'll go with then. I like it. Justin, what were your three choices? So looking at what I have, I have either wealth with parentheses chosen, max shock, max shock, parentheses exterminatus, and determination, parentheses find the truth. I think I'm going to go with determination. Um, okay. Good I think choice. That's fit my my backstory, and I'll I'll write a full dissertation on it later. So <laughs> I love it. All right, and long. The choice between determination and conviction. Uh, and conviction is the ability to resist corruption. Now, in this game, 
there are things that corrupt you. And when you when you become corrupted, you fall closer and closer to chaos. You fall further away from the worship of the god emperors. So corruption is a very bad thing, particularly for members of the ministorum. Um, so conviction helps you resist that. So that's not a bad thing. Yeah, I think I'll go for conviction because I don't think my toughness is going to be that high for determination. Okay. I like it. All right, I'm going to go back here and take a look. So, uh, what were the three um, that you you cho you chose, Ashley? What were your origin accomplishments and goals? Uh, origin is heresy begets retribution. Okay. Purge the unclean for your accomplishment. So, oh, it's off to the side. So, determination, max wound, um, and influence. Okay. Yep, those are the third. So once again, determination helps you change wounds to shock. Max wounds just improves your total number of hit points and influences your ability to get things done in society. Maybe I'll do max wounds. I like it. We'll keep it exciting. I like it. Okay, so um, you've got your, uh, everybody's got their selected bonus. Now, objectives is the next thing, um, and you don't you don't roll these right now. You roll a new objective uh, at the beginning of every session, and if you manage to work your objective into um, into your play during that session, uh, I'm trying to remember what you get here. Page thirty. I believe you regenerate a uh, point. I randomly rolled mine just to see what I would get. Recant a holy litany applicable to the current situation. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and that's what it is. You you roll what you roll it every session. And if you work that into your role play during the session, you earn a wrath point. And it could exceed your two wrath points. Um, but remember at the beginning of every session, you reset to two. So if you've got more than two during a session, use them. They're there to use. Cool. All right, so that brings us to customization. Now, um, everybody has 200 experience points. Now, before we get to customization, though, we need to we need to uh, take a look at Ashley and get her up to an ascension package. So, we're going to talk a little bit about ascension packages. So. In this game, when you go from tier to tier, uh, you can just pick like the next archetype up or a different archetype altogether, um, or you can you can basically say, "No, I like my archetype. I want to stay a sister hospitaler." Um, and then you have different options for um, how you um, ascend to tier two, and we're going to go over those right now when I find the page for them. If we ever hit these lulls, if you guys just want to ask me a question about 40k lore, I can definitely just fill the space. With that. <laughs> you can just, <laughs> just jump, just jump right in. Yeah, absolutely. So your ascension packages, um, the choice there's there's several choices. So we're gonna go. I'm gonna go through them slowly with you, and you can see which one sounds good for you. So the first one is called Back from the Brink, and you spend ten experience points once you're leveled up to you know. Um, to get it. So it would reduce your, your total experience points by 10. Um, you, after a, horror, a, a horrific encounter, you were somehow reconstructed by the marvels of holy or unholy technology. You get a memorable injury twice. You get a traumatic injury twice. And then you get to replace any parts of your body that were utterly destroyed by the appropriate augmentics. And you may choose an option of any rarity the DM choose as appropriate. So this is cybernetic enhancement. So you would become a cybernetic sister of battle. Okay, okay. The second ascension package you could choose from is Dauntless Reputation. With a single glorious act of extraordinary merit, you gained tremendous reputation. Word of your exploits is spread, and you have gained both notoriety and disciples devoted to your cause. This costs 30 experience points times your new tier. So it would cost you 60 experience points to, to take this package, your 
you would get plus two to your influence. Um, you would either, and then you would gain the devotee talent, and you do not need to meet the leadership requirement for it. You would get a tremendous reputation with a faction of your choice and an enemy. So it's a pretty expensive ascension package mm-hmm. for some influence. Uh, personally, not my favorite. Demanding patron. You work for somebody that demands a lot from you, basically. I mean, it's several paragraphs, and you can read through it when you get a chance. But the benefits of it are, well, it costs you 20 experience points, um, and it requires you to have a persuasion skill of three or greater. So you would have to increase your persuasion to three and then spend the 20 experience points to be a, to have this um demanding patron ascension package but you get a new keyword the keyword of whoever your patron is so you know if you're working as a sister of uh, a sister hospital or maybe your new patron is the inquisition so you might get the inquisition keyword or maybe you know it could be any imperial faction um you are now reporting to your demanding patron between your adventures you immediately gain one item of rare war gear with a value of of five or greater so a really nice piece of gear you immediately gain two wealth and you immediately gain two influence so again not a not not a bad one you get you get better gear and everything the next is perfidious wretch um this cost would cost you uh 10 you'd have to have a cunning of three um but basically, it means that you uh, you betray your allies and everything. It doesn't really fit with a sister of yeah. battle. No, thanks. Psychic revelations, you become a psyker. Uh, also doesn't really fit with the sisters of battle. They don't really go in for that. Um, and then the last one is stay the course. Basically, you're just sticking with what you know. This would cost you 20 experience points. You'd get plus one influence. Um, If you don't have a memorable injury, which you don't, you would roll on the memorable injury table and decide with your DM how you would receive that. Uh, If that memorable injury caused you the loss of any body part, you would get augmentations for it. And then you would get to choose either two items of rare war gear with a value of five, or you would would be able to choose one very rare item of war gear with a value of five. And those could could include cybernetics. So those are basically the ascension uh, packages you could choose. Um, The demanding patron, back from the brink, dauntless reputation, and stay the course are the ones that would most likely apply to a sister of battle. Um, And you don't really have to choose tonight. Uh, we can talk. We can talk about it over the next two weeks, and you can take a look at it. You can figure out what you what you want to do uh, before you make that decision. Yeah, um, I am interested in back from the brink and mm-hmm. also the last one. Back from the brink the and course. stay the course. Yeah, back for back for, back from the brink is 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 kind of cool because you know you were you were in some horrific battle. Um, and then you were brought back basically from death and turned into this, you know, augmented cybernetic sister of battle. And yeah. it's pretty cool. And you will find in, in this game, a lot of people get augmetics. There's a, there's a lot of, you'll get, you'll, there will be grievous wounds in this game. Some oh, of you yeah. will lose limbs without a doubt. So, uh, it's just the way the, it's just the way the world works. So don't feel bad about that. But you can think about that um, and then ascend. Then we'll do your ascension package. And then you'll know after you spend as many experience points as you need to take that ascension package, then you'll know how many more experience points you have left. Perfect. Okay. Sounds cool. So we're not going to actually spend our XP tonight in buying attributes and skills and talents. But basically, what are, however many experience points you have left, you can spend. Either in strength, which is exactly what it sounds like, strength, toughness, that's your physical ruggedness, agility, uh, agility works off of your um, your ability to shoot things at range. Uh, strength is obviously used for weapon skills. Uh, no, I take that back. Initiative is used for weapon skills. Agility is used for um, uh, long range weapons. So you've got strength, toughness, agility, initiative, willpower, intellect, and fellowship. 
there are, those stats pretty much are exactly what they sound like. And you can raise those. Humans have a maximum of eight. So you're not going to get to eight, obviously, unless you want ones in, in a lot of things. But you have those options. Uh, as as your, um, And then you can spend points on skills. Once again, you can go through and you can see all the skills that are available. Uh, pick what you want uh, that makes sense for your character. Your character archetype will already come with certain skills. Um, and then the last thing you can spend your experience points, well, there's two other things. You can actually spend experience points on wealth. You can buy additional wealth, one wealth for one experience point. I think the maximum is two additional wealth. You can use wealth to change influence roles and to change when you're trying to, to purchase or acquire gear. You can use wealth in that way. But I would not recommend spending experience points on wealth because throughout the adventures, you may accumulate some wealth as well. Part, if, you, if you want to, you can, but it wouldn't be how I would spend them. And then there are talents, and that we talked a little bit about them. They're the that make your character unique, even within your archetype. There are some general talents that anybody can take, and then there are a lot of talents that can only be taken by specific people with specific keywords. Uh, there are talents in the core book. There are talents in uh, the Forbidden Systems Player's Guide. There's talents in Redacted Records and Redacted Records 2. So there's a lot of information to go over over the next couple of weeks. Feel free to float ideas to me about talents or what I think about talents. Or if you or if you know you want your character to be able to do something good and you're not sure what talent you need to look for, let me know. I'll point you towards the talents that might, might be what you're looking for. So... We'll do that when everything is done. When you've got all of that done, you can hit submit and it will build your character. And we will we will basically be ready to play at that point. Now, before we get to there, though, we've got a series of questions we're going to go through to kind of help better define who your character is and possibly relationships between your characters. So uh, we're going to start with your past. Um, and we'll start with Ashley. Where are you from? And, and what I mean for this one is, are you from the Gilead system or did you come here on the Veronius Rogue Trader Flotilla? Did you come with the fleet or were you from this system? Um, I think she came with the fleet. Okay. okay. And uh, would you say that you were when you when you were a child, were you born in a in a in a hive city like a, you know, a giant city size uh, towering, you know, megalopolis, you know, that's thousands of stories tall and goes into the bedrock? Or are you from like an agro world where they grew, you know, where they grew the foodstuffs for the Imperium? I think um, more of like a smaller world, like an agricultural okay. world. Okay, okay. So you were from an ag world uh, from somewhere on the other side of the Cicatrix Maledictum and you came with the Veronius fleet. Um Already kind of so you, you we already know that you're a sister of battle, so you probably spent your days in prayer and penance. Um was it the was this the first time you left your home world when you joined the Veronius fleet, or have you been to other worlds um as part of your duties uh as a sister of battle? She's done some traveling. Okay. Um, not a lot. I would say this is maybe like her second or third. Okay. Okay. Melissa, how how about you? Uh, we already kind of said you were from the Gilead system since you were protecting Enoch. Um, are you from Enoch? Are you from Are you from the Shrine World? Um, or or do you think you're from one of the Hive worlds or or one of the Agro worlds? Um. So I unfortunately lost my little thing that I was reading. So um. Uh, and you don't have to decide now. It's something you can think about. Um. Well, for right now, we'll say that I, um, because that was a, a place to uh, pilgrimage to, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so there are there are people who live there. Uh, there are like a lot of ministorum priests and everyone there are sisters of battle that maintain um, the all the pilgrimage sites. But, yeah, but you don't have to be. The other that. choice that I had, because I was like following like the saint person, I'm going to mm -hmm. say that I was probably from somewhere else. Okay. I like it. I like it. Um how do you feel about your home? Do you miss it? 
I am called to do the work that I'm doing. So I don't have the luxury of fantastic. Do you think as a sister of battle that you've worked with um, Ashley's sister hospitaler before? Do you think you know one another? Probably yeah, not because she's coming from the Veronius fleet. Um, so you probably didn't meet before, actually, now that I think about it. So I will retract that question. Well, never mind, because I was going to say yes. So, <laughs> But it have been nice. I know. You'll know one another soon enough. Uh, Long, your death cult assassin, did he come with the Veronius fleet or was he born in the Gilead system? So what is this Gilead system? The Gilead system is the system of, of the setting. So it's a system of planets, including a, a night planet, a couple of hive planets, an uh, agricultural world. A Mechanicus Forge world, a Shrine world. It's it's just a it's like a solar system. I'll be born here. Okay, so you're from Gilead. Uh, were you born in a hive city, like one of the bustling uh, megalopolises on Gilead Prime or Cherubitum, or or were you born on an agricultural world or the Shrine world? Or let's do hive. Okay, so you're born in a hive. Um, do you miss living in the hive or are you happy to be free of it? I don't miss it. Okay. okay. Justin, how about you? Did you come on the Veronius fleet or were you from the Gilead system? Uh, I came from the Veronius fleet. Okay. Um, <laughs> good. Is your inquisitor on the Veronius uh, flotilla? Did that, or were you sent um, without your inquisitor? Uh, I was sent without my Inquisitor in order to try and do something on my own. He sent me as a okay. side mission to try and figure out what he was doing. And I decided that I would help him out by splitting splitting up and uh, tracking down a lead from my end while also okay. maybe possibly feeding my own interests as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and as a, as an inquisitor, obviously you've probably been travel, you've traveled probably to many worlds. Um, so we will skip over that. When, when you were, when you were young, when you were a child, were you from a, a noble family or were you a commoner? Uh, I was a commoner, but, um, certain things about me, my, uh, psycho powers, my different things that I can do were big things as to which I was, recruited into the inquisition to become an interrogator and hopefully one day an inquisitor as well so i have certain abilities certain things about me that brought people to me to uh want to recruit me for the program so fantastic I mean, and are the chosen one are the chosen one uh jeff you're a electro priest um were you did you come on the fleet or were you from gilead What's the dispersion right now? What are we at now in terms of people born in the system versus not? Born uh, in the system? Long and Melissa are born in the system, and Ashley and Justin came on the fleet. Oh, so I get to be the swing vote. Tiger. The swing vote. There okay, is a so, Forge world here, uh, Averis. Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, I was thinking about that, but I was specifically born and spent my early years on an orbital station. I didn't even know that planets existed. Um, so. I, I was looking to see whether or not Avacris has any kind of like orbital stations above it. Cause I know that's the forge world, right? Like that's the, yep. in the, in the Gilead system. Yep. So if there's some sort of orbital station above it, oh, yeah. or if, if there's there would something be, like that, there'd be multiple void stations and planet and planetary defense platforms uh, in orbit above the yeah. planet. I think that's probably where, uh, where I'm, I would be from. Okay. And cool. Eventually. Cool. So some sort of pilgrimage down to the the forge world. Now, was your family, uh, I mean, were you a commoner? Was your family, you know, is was a member of your family a tech priest? I mean, how how were you yeah. raised in Mechanicum? Because it's it's very rare for someone to be brought in to the to the tech priesthood. My feeling is that the I, I was raised on the orbital station because a parent, whatever parent was was raising me. Uh, was was stationed there as like um, like whether it's a tech priest, Lex mechanic, something like that. Like that's where they were stationed specifically to like maintain that that station. And so that's where I kind of came into it. Now, did do you have two parents or are you that born? I mean, mm. were you were you test tubed by your parent who wanted a child or? Mm, I'll take the two parents. I'll have two parents. 
All right. Uh, I'll, I like I'll it. Do yeah. I like it. So moving on. Um, so we know how you joined the Mechanicum. Uh, we know how Justin joined the Inquisition. Long, how did uh, how did your death cult assassin join your faction? I mean, were you forced to join it? Um, did you seek them out through the Ministarum? How did that happen? I'd say seek them out. Okay. Um, so you sought them out. They saw something in you, and they trained you. Now, since you're coming... Uh, I like it. I like it. Uh, how does your do? Do you remember your family? Did you seek them out as a child, or were you a, a young man, or woman, or whomever you want to be? So, ask that question again. Um, would you remember your family from before you joined your faction? Like, did were you did you seek them out as a young child? Um, do you have fond memories of your family or did you leave because of the horrors of your family? No, I definitely am fond of them. I'd say they were, I was familiar with what they were, who they are. So okay. I'm a good idea of them. Okay. Okay. And how about you, Melissa? What was, uh, what was your family life like? Why did you choose to become a sister of battle? So did I read, and I didn't read a whole lot, um, but I thought I read something that they were generally like orphans that were plucked from orphanages and then like. Yeah, they're either usually taken from orphanages or their parents are killed and as orphans, then they're selected. So, yes. Yeah, you're definitely family's dead, but do you remember them at all um, or or those your first memories of the orphanage? I'll go with the latter. I'll go with like, that's why she is so in on this whole thing is because it's all she's known. So she was uh, from a very young age uh, mm -hmm. raised to uh, believe this way. And how about you, Ashley? How was your sister? Was she, does she remember anything before the orphanage? Um, Not really. Cause she was kidnapped. And so in the kidnapping, she witnessed the murder of her family. So that's uh -huh. really all that she remembers of them. Um, was her mother's prayers uh, that were not heeded, uh, but later uh, saved her life. Nice, nice. I like it. Um, what is what is what is your sister hospitaler's greatest fear? Oh, that's a great question. Um. Her greatest fear is to become a heretic and enact the evil things that were attempted to be cast upon her nice, uh, nice. and summon demons. So fall from the emperor's grace and, and, mm -hmm. and okay, I like it. How about uh, how about you, Melissa? What is your sister of battle's greatest fear? me kind of look through my choices again um i would say and i don't know if this fits in the lore but sort of these like holy places or relics or things like there, there's a sense of keeping them out of the wrong hands mm -hmm. so like the sites need to not be overrun and the relics need to be found and there's too many holy sites and there's too many relics to stay on top of everything all at the same time. And so that's sort of the like, always got to stay busy, always got to be doing these things because, you know, it would be absolutely horrible for these things, these places and these items to, you know, kind of fall into the wrong hands. That is perfect and absolutely in keeping with the lore because that is there are whole segments of, of the sisters of battle and others who, who, seek out lost holy relics and reliquaries and protect them. Long, what is your death cult assassin's greatest fear? Something along the lines of the emperor not recognizing my efforts. Okay. Okay. I like that. That makes complete sense. How about you, Justin? Um 
I think my greatest fear would be um, not being able to uh, get to the bottom of the uh, the mystery or the the case I'm trying to solve. Okay. Right? That that would be my biggest fear of not being able to tie up the loose ends that I've found and that I need to uh, resolve before my time with the Inquisition is over. I like it. And Jeff, your electro priest, what's his greatest fear? That power is wasted on the living organisms uh, in the in the galaxy in the universe, and uh, and and it is a it is a what's what's the way I want to think about it? it is a wave, or it is a um, the momentum of their growth is like is too much. Uh, so like. Yeah, so that's, that's what I think it is that he's that he's come he's come to the crusade too late uh, to to be able to make an a, a, like an impact on it. Right. I like it. I'm getting a good I, I'm starting to get a good idea who these who these characters are, and uh, I, that's fantastic. So um, between now and two weeks from now, we'll finish up the characters. We'll finish up our skills. We'll finish up our attributes. We'll select our talents. Uh, and we'll finalize them. Now, we are going to be playing through the litanies of the Lost Adventures. So these are four published adventures by Cubicle 7. Uh, they all take place between like Tier 2 slash Tier 3 characters. The first one's kind of Tier 1, Tier 2, so I beefed it up a little bit. But before we jump right into the litanies of Lost, I want us to have uh, at least one session where we're just kind of getting the hang of the mechanics how the skills work, how combat works, how foundry works with it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piece together a little adventure, um, a little one shot, you might say, that is going to take place in two weeks. Um, and I need everybody who's still in the chat to help me with this. So what's gonna happen is in two weeks, our uh, our faithful. Uh, group of troubleshooters who work for the Veronius Rogue Trader are going to be asked to deal with a space hulk that has emerged from the warp. Um, and this is kind of cool. In the Redacted Records uh, book, Redacted Records 1, they have these tools that allow you to basically generate a space hulk. Um, if you just want to do a kind of quick down and dirty. Uh, and so we're going to do that. Uh, so we've got rollable tables in here. And uh, we're going to we're going to do the Space Hulk generator. Um, so if every all my players will go into the rollable tables, open the folder for redacted records one. And then go down to Space Hulk generator. I think you can see things that we can't see. You yeah, guys can't see that? We have permission for that. Well, mm -hmm. well, damn it. All right, then I will roll instead. And what, what's going to happen, everybody in chat who's still listening, two, I'm going to roll two seconds. twice. I'll, I'll give it to him. I can get, I can get it. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, just vamp for a second. Jeopardy. I'm Justin, vamp. So, Justin, so what's going to happen? You? We need you. We so, need you. Um, <laughs> so for these Space Hawks, what we'll be right. doing is we're going we're gonna to give an origin, where they came from. Uh, we're going to give what the purpose of the Space Hulk was and the objective of it was. And we're going to give a little bit of um, internal uh, concerns and external concerns for the players. Give them a couple of weeks to mull it over in their minds. Uh, and then we're going to see how they do with dealing with the Space Hulk. Space Hulk. Yeah, we can see it now. So you okay, so if, records one, Space Hulk generator. Yep. yep. So go down to the origin table and I'm going to have first, I'm going to have Ashley and Melissa each roll once. And we're going to see what we get on that table. And then people in chat, tell us which one you want to see. So Ashley got an Imperial Space Hulk. Uh, so this is a this is a ship from the Imperium's past that comes out of the warp um, and that they would have to be boarding for some reason. Melissa got a Chaos Hulk. So this is a this is a space hulk that has been in uh, in the warp, infested potentially by chaos. 
uh, that our, our players would have to deal with. So in the chat, who wants chaos? Who wants Imperium? Oh, one vote for each so far. Somebody give me a second vote. Cause if, if, if for one of them, if you make me vote, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> need a swing vote. Somebody give me it. Okay. There we go. Chaos. Oh, damn. Three chaos. Came in. Oh. Two more for Imperium, Imperium though. Oh, three for chaos. 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 People, All right. Chaos, chaos wins. Chaos. People chaos want us win. to die. They want us to okay. die real bad. <laughs> Just so like we're gonna, real life. Chaos. We're gonna wins. have we're gonna have a chaos um space hulk. That's fantastic. Okay. Um people were saying oh no earlier when you said space hulk, so I'm really kind of terrified. <laughs> so what a space hulk is is it's it's a ship or it's a group of ships that were lost in the warp and the warp is how you travel faster than light here it's it's basically like anybody see the movie event horizon yeah. uh, that ship yeah. when it pops out yeah. that's a space hulk and that's the kind of shit you're going to be dealing with it's a horribly corrupted ship that is potentially infested by aliens or demons or something else and and you're going to deal with it Okay, go to the hazards table, and Long and Justin each give me a roll on the hazards table. Are you proud I was able to find the roll, Jeff? That was good. That was good. So our two choices are the warp has tainted the Space Hulk to its very core, and every level of each vessel is completely saturated with dangerous warp energies. I love that. Makes sense. And the second one is gravitational surges. So you're going to have all kinds of gravity problems. So who wants who wants warp and who wants gravity? I think I know what they're going to go with. I, I think I, I think I might, too. Hmm. Warp oh or God, gravity? Oh, it's close. Three for warp, two for gravity. Three for each. We're tied. Oh, oh, I, extra one for I've gravity. been proven wrong. I've been proven and wrong. Warp, a couple of warp, a couple warp. of warp. Couple of warp. A couple for Nader. Gravity. It's weird. Gravity. This, warp. This gravity. Is close. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna it say gravity. I, I'm gonna say gravity. Right. It looks like gravity. Um, so we've got a space hulk, uh, a, a chaos space hulk that is that's suffering from some all sorts of gravitational issues. Now we're gonna roll an external event and an internal event. Uh, and these are gonna be things that you have to deal with. Um while you're dealing with the Space Hulk. So this is under Space Hulk events, not Space Hulk generator. And we're to Jeff and Ashley, external event. Roll an external event. All right. Let's see. Okay, so... Our choices for chat are collision course. Solar winds and residual momentum is going to move this space hawk into collision with something we don't want to colli- want it to collide with. So uh, our our team is being sent there, or part of their mission is to force it to change course somehow. Your second choice is heavy fire, a battle barge of the Absolvers Astartes. Uh, comes up to the Space Hulk while our group of troubleshooters are on the Space Hulk, and they start blowing it into space dust. For some reason, the Absolvers want to destroy this ship, and our group of troubleshooters have to succeed in whatever their mission is and get off the ship before the Space Marines absolutely destroy it. So collision course or death by Space Marines? Guys, I can tell the Space Marines to stop. I have jurisdiction over them, so we can solve this really easily. Maybe they have diplomatic <laughs> immunity, though. But, Jeffrey, it's been revoked. All right, we got collision like course. Collision. It is so almost we've got, unanimous uh, for collision yep. course. Chaos, a chaos hulk with <laughs> gravity problems on a collision course. Makes sense. Last roll we're going to do for me to help figure out what I'm going to do to you guys is an internal <laughs> event. And that's going to be Melissa and Long. Roll me an internal event. And let's see the final thing you have to deal with on this Space Hulk is. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Uh, your choices are Undying Grudge. The explorers, our group, is caught in the middle between a bitter resource war between descendants of the ship's crew and grandchildren of the Astra Militarum Regiment that was on the ship. That one doesn't make a lot of sense with the Chaos guys, uh, so it could be the Chaos ship versus some Chaos demons. I'd probably flavor it that way. Your second choice, Melissa's choice, is the Hornet's Nest. Uh, breaching a former cargo hold disturbs hibernating hive of Psycho Noonan. They're two-meter-long psychic, basically mosquitoes that implant crap in the brains of dormant psychers or anyone who might even potentially be a latent psyker. So that's a little horrific. Hornet's Nest or Undying Grudge? What do you guys think? Do we want to re-roll since Undying Grudge didn't really make any sense? I love that. Give me a third roll, Justin. He'll be here for a while. He has to find it. Shut up. <laughs> it's a new event. Which, which one is this? Which one Space Holt events. Internal. Internal, Internal events. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> it's rolling. Survivors. Hammering can be heard from inside sealed compartments along with voices begging for release, promising a share of untold riches inside. But nothing human could have survived on a hulk like this for so long, could they? No way to tell until you open the door. Ooh. I like that one personally. We're not voting. I know. I'm just right, giving my dude. Stop swaying the vote, man. <laughs> Okay, because you're working because I like the voting site. You can't be doing that <laughs> because this is Justin's first time playing with me. We're gonna do both. We're gonna do space bugs and survivors, oh, oh or God. perhaps <laughs> Nurgle oh. plague bearers. Who knows? All right, wow, so thanks, uh, that's gonna be fantastic. <laughs> you're welcome, so everyone. Man. I'm glad so, you showed up. We got great practice with character generation exactly. today. You know, so you'll be able to you'll be able to come in and make a new character really fast after you guys die in our in our just our our maiden voyage of trying to figure out the rules. You'll be we're fine. We're just gonna be all death cult assassins if we die. <laughs> so uh so yeah, so that's the basics of character creation for Wrath and Glory. We've still got a little bit of work to do. We got some talents to select, we've got some attributes to select, we've got some skills to select, and a little bit of backstory to fill in. But if you come back in two weeks, you'll get to meet our sister hospitaler, our sister of battle, our death cult assassin, our inquisitorial interrogator, and our electro priest as they become a solid squad of troubleshooters under Jackal Veronius's Imperium writ to help keep the Gilead system safe and sound with their first mission being dealing with a Chaos Space Hulk that has come out of the warp, showing signs of incredible gravino gravinomic anomalies and gravity-distorting fields that is on a collision course for something bad. You'll find out what it is in two weeks. And once they get on it, they're going to have to deal with something alive on the Space Hulk and space bugs. That sounds amazing. You, you can't make this stuff up. This is Warhammer 40k uh, it's at its grim best. Dark, if you ask it me. is as grim dark as you get. I really appreciate all my players uh, bearing with me uh, as we went through this process tonight. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of lore to this system. Uh, and thank you to everybody who is watching here uh, either tonight on Twitch or if you're watching later on YouTube. Um, please give us a like. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Throw some comments in there on how bad I'm screwing up Warhammer 40k. I I fully respect the fact that there are experts out there that make me look like a novice or a five year old child playing with blocks. It's all good. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you get a chance, come check a look at us on Twitch. Um, we'd always appreciate having a live audience, and and we we try to engage with you. I know I did a crappy job tonight of seeing what was going on uh, in chat, but that's because I was utterly distracted by these wonderful players. That's all I got. That is all I got. Jeff, what do you got? Yeah, man. Awesome. I'm very excited. Uh, two weeks is going to be a very long time, it seems like. Uh, 
But we do have some other games in between now and then that you can check out. If you want to come back tomorrow, you can see a few of us here. Definitely not Justin. Uh, a few of us here as we're going to be playing some Mothership, uh, as we're going to be doing a couple weeks worth of Mothership. We mentioned Event Horizon before. There's a little bit of Event Horizon sort of influence, uh, kind of, sort of, and what we're doing tomorrow. Uh, Monday, we're going to be doing another space game. We've done a lot of space games. Uh, Fragged Empire, second edition. It's a um, little more Mass Effect, less, uh, less grimdark, but still very fun. Uh, Tuesday, we are doing Marvel Multiverse role-playing game. You can see Aaron and Melissa and myself playing in that one. Uh, we've got Werewolf the Apocalypse, the new fifth, ver fifth edition version. Uh, that's on Thursdays. Uh, same crews in that. Not, well, I should say Melissa, Aaron, myself. Uh, and then uh, this uh, this Warhammer 40K game is going to be alternating Friday nights with Delta Green. So if you're a fan of Delta Green, uh, you, uh, you should come watch that. And if you're not a fan of Delta Green... Uh, get yourself right and become mm -hmm. a fan of Delta Green because it's an amazing fact. Game. Uh, but that is it. I think let's go ahead and raid somebody. I don't think our buddies at the Defenders are up, so I'm gonna have to find someone else. So let's see. Uh, looks like let's do some. Let's do some. Yeah, let's do some Dork Tales. Uh, so yeah, uh, they're playing some Unknown Armies, which is a game I've been really wanting to play. Predates Delta Green. A lot of the same dudes uh, who worked on Delta Green made it. So we're going to go ahead and give them a raid. Thanks for everyone hanging out. And we'll see you all next time. Bye -bye. Good night. Peace. <laughs>